Good morning. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Good morning, this is Allison Slack with Fuse Hub. We're gonna wait another minute or two before we get started. Okay, we'll go ahead. Um, again, good morning. I'm Allison Slack, uh, Manager for Manufacturing Related Strategic Initiatives at Fuse Hub. Uh, for those of us joining us uh, from Europe, good afternoon. Fuse Hub is a not for profit organization that connects New York's small and mid sized manufacturing companies to the resources, programs, and expertise they need for technology commercialization, innovation, and business growth. What Fuse Hub does is uh, we connect, uh, we help navigate New York's robust network of industry experts at uh, university research centers, economic development organizations, manufacturing extension partnership centers, and other providers. Uh, we are the statewide New York Manufacturing Extension Partnership Center, and we are supported by Empire State Development's Division of Science, Technology, and Innovation, otherwise known as NYSTAR. And today we're here to learn about the power of the transatlantic supply chain connections in advanced electronics industries. We're hoping that participants in these webinars become engaged in our initiative to make B2B connections between the clusters across Europe and North America, and particularly in New York State. This is the third in a series of webinars focused on specific advanced electronics industry areas from autonomous operations to smart cities today. Uh, we covered health applications, and um, this is the third out of four webinars in the series. So for this third webinar, we're hosting a discussion about smart cities and the electronics innovations that are enabling them. Smart cities use data, sensors, and Internet of Things technologies to efficiently manage resources, infrastructure, and other services and systems. And in this webinar, we're going to present uh, speakers from Grenoble, which is a leading global smart city as well as from electronics companies whose products are enabling these urban transformations. We'll also hear from National Grid, an electric utility that is driving the development of some smart city systems in upstate New York. So first you'll hear from a couple of economic development representatives, um, Lamar and Johan, uh, that are doing the work of facilitating this transatlantic advanced electronics B2B connection. Uh, FuseHub is doing this because FuseHub is a partner of New York Loves Nanotech, that's a consortium of organizations and companies that have joined forces to promote New York and all the state has to offer to high-tech industries. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Lamar Hill of Fusion Market Group to talk a little bit more about this alliance. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be zippy because uh, you've heard from me before. So, in essence, we started uh, inter interfacing with various clusters in Europe about 15 years ago, and that partnership has grown and become more formal. And uh, we we run periodic uh, live business connection forums. We'll have our second one this fall in Munich. And we also do these webinars. So uh, we're gonna talk today about uh, smart cities, but we also, in the broader context of the partnership to support cross-Atlantic industrial ties. So, um, next slide. 
So some of the things that we envision doing to support small, medium-sized enterprises as they expand in North America and Europe are providing access to uh, venture capital and, and, and other financing vehicles, introduce uh, companies to government grant opportunities and programs, connect to R&D assets uh, across the entire network. So if you're a North American company wanting to get more involved in Europe and expand in Europe, uh, our partners, uh, our Silicon Europe cluster partners can help uh, identify potential R&D assets for you and vice versa. If you're a European company coming to the North America, we can connect you to um, to university research programs and centers that can help uh, accelerate your technology. We also facilitate joint ventures. Uh, we can help establish manufacturing representatives. Uh, we all work on workforce education and we and we do organize events, so next slide. To, to put in the context of North America and advanced electronic clusters going east to west, uh, Boston has historically been a big cluster of advanced electronics activity here in upstate New York, starting with IBM back in the 1950s and, and early 60s. We have had a very vital advanced electronics cluster it spread, it spread across all of upstate, all of New York State, from Long Island to Buffalo. And we've hosted iconic technology-driven companies like IBM and General Electric and Bausch and & Lomb and Corning and Xerox and Kodak and General Electric, on and on and on. Uh, then we have uh, Quebec and Ontario up in Canada. There's the uh, Austin, Dallas, Texas cluster, Phoenix, Arizona, Boise, Idaho, Silicon Valley, Portland, Oregon, and uh, the uh, Southeast also. So um, we have a vital network of clusters. They're not quite as organized. They're more organic here in North America than they are, for instance, uh, in Europe. So next slide. Next slide there, Allison. There we go. So is it not progressing? To, it, 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 it's fine. Just to um, to wrap up, uh, we've we've had these series of webinars, which Allison mentioned. The next one is scheduled for Thursday, October 18th. It'll be on energy systems, and then we have a half day business connection forum at Infineon's global headquarters in Munich on, on Monday, November 12th. And then there's a trade show, Electronica and Semicon Europa, that we hope the companies that participate on Monday the 12th uh, can meet with each other uh, as necessary during the course of that week. And uh, finally, I believe, uh, is that my last slide, Allison? No, there we go. Unless you want to cover these. No, I'm not going to cover this. These are just some of the assets around advanced electronics in, in New York. Um, okay, Allison, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, so uh, before I turn it over to Johan, I just want to say to those uh, listening in, you can submit questions um, as we go, and we'll address them at the end. Uh, you can do that in your GoToWebinar control panel under the questions tab. Uh, next, we'll have Johan Lokoch speak. He is uh, from DSP Valley, one of the uh, industry clusters in Europe that Lamar was speaking about, and he's here to discuss uh, the broader Silicon Europe Alliance. Okay, thanks, Alison. And indeed, my name is uh, Johan Lokoch from DSP Valley, based in Belgium. And uh, so we are one of the founding members, founding clusters of the Silicon Europe Alliance. Uh, the alliance I would like to introduce to you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the Silicon Europe Alliance uh, today is uh, a collaboration of 12 European uh, clusters active in advanced electronics, um, meaning things like micro nano electronics, photonics, ICT, software, etc. Uh, it's an initiative taken in 2015 
uh, which uh, uh, aims to foster cooperation and innovation across Europe. So in other words, we want to support our members, which are SMEs, larger companies, research institutes and universities to accelerate their R&D and business connections. If you go to the next slide, then you see where all the clusters, the current 12 cluster partners are uh, located. Uh, and what you see is that we today we cover most of Western Europe and maybe in the future, the map will be become greener. Um, and maybe next slide. Um, and as a collaboration of 12 clusters, uh, as I said before, we, we want to foster cross fertilization uh, actions between our ecosystems. And uh, for this, for this, we can organize several things and a few examples are mentioned on this slide. And I would like to also draw your attention to maybe one specific event, which has also relation to the US, um, is uh, on the, the right bottom side is an open innovation day, which we organized together with Boston Scientific. Um, it's an event uh, where we allow a larger company to, to meet uh, about uh, 40 to 50 highly inno innovative uh, upfront selected companies from Europe. Um, and this is a typical example of activities we really could do also in a, in a transatlantic way, as it is shown today uh, with this uh, American company. Uh, maybe in the next slide, please. Um, being a collaboration of uh, European clusters, uh, we are very well uh, positioned to represent the European advanced electronics, micro and nano electronics industry, and certainly the SMEs. And that's also the main reason uh, why we are also collaborating with yeah, organizations like uh, Center of Economic Growth, New York Los Nanotech of USAP, as Lamar was already mentioning. And uh, this collaboration will help to create a framework um, which can stimulate and support companies and organizations on both sides of the ocean to explore cross-Atlantic business opportunities. And this is exactly what we want to achieve. And maybe next slide. And for this, of course, uh, we set up activities as where you are participating in today, like webinars and business connection forum uh, Lemar was mentioning. So please put that date in your agenda, uh, 12th of November in Munich. We hope to see there many US companies uh, that we then can meet. And then on the last slide, uh, if you want to have some uh, names um, representing the Select in Europe Alliance um, and you have a contact address. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Johan. And um... When we end this webinar, I'll end on a slide that has the contact information for all the speakers today. So you can count on that later in the presentation. And uh, by the way, these slides and the recording will be available on the Fuse Hub website uh, later this week uh, for posterity. Uh, next, uh, we'll hear from a couple of uh, more organizations in Europe. Uh, first, Anne Elizabeth Cote. She is the innovation manager for the greater Grenoble city area one of uh, the world's leading smart cities in implementing these systems. Anne Elizabeth. It's cool. Hi, we're actually going to do this presentation uh, as two people. So my name's Kate and I'm in the same team as Anne Elizabeth. So I'm going to speak to you a little bit about our strategy here and then Anne Elizabeth will carry on and speak about a specific example. So you can go to the next slide, please. Sure, and Kate, um, your sound is a little unsteady. Uh, if you have an opportunity to move closer to the laptop, that might help. Can I move the laptop closer to me? <laughs> is that any better? Yes, it is. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So here in Grenoble, we have a very high performing innovation ecosystem. We have a lot of researchers, a lot of universities, a lot of top industries, leading manufacturers in the world, and also cutting edge SMEs. But what we're most proud of here is how everyone works together very well. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. So our role as local government is to support our innovation ecosystem, to provide infrastructure, so university buildings, fiber optic cables and everything, and then also to help companies to develop to support technology transfer from research to industry. 
and to help develop different projects and to make sure that people are getting educated in the right field to, to be used for the industry as well. So if you go to the next slide, please. So here in Grenoble, we were actually a smart city, I guess, before the word smart city was really commonly used. So we had the first environmentally district in France, environmentally friendly district in France, which was uh, which was awarded in 2005. Um, and our goal has kind of been to provide the opportunity for, for companies and researchers in our area to test out their products on our territory and to um, and to kind of allow this innovation ecosystem to, to thrive. So in the last few years, we've started to see results from the first smart city projects that we developed here. So there's the Viva City project, which was one of the original smart meter projects in France. Um, and this is now get, got to the point where it's being deployed on a large level over the whole territory. So the whole 49 different municipalities that make up the greater city area um, and a half million inhabitants in the city. And it's going to be deployed in all homes in the area. So this is one example of where we're up to now. So because we started doing this um, a long time ago, the smart city kind of field, we now have realized that we can have great technology, but without actually, sorry, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So you can have the great technology, you can have the best technology in the world, but you also need people to use the technology properly and to understand why they need to change their behavior and how to change their behavior to actually have an impact. So for example, these smart meters, they're not much use if people don't actually know how to change their behavior to diminish their, their, uh, their consumption at the same time. Um, so there are two ways of doing this, obviously, there's the way of banning certain behaviors, so banning high polluting vehicles, and also the, the aspect of education to inform people why they need to change their behavior and how to do it. So we're very much working on these like soft measures, I guess, at the moment, as well as the scientific techno side. Uh, so next slide, please. So in conclusion, we've always spoken about the triple helix of innovation here between research, industry and universities. And what we're now trying to do is also to bring people, citizens into this, into this uh, triple helix, have a quadruple helix, and also to support this collaboration between all the different actors in the city. And we think for real industrial success, that the citizens must be added into the mix and to be able to adopt these new technologies. So I'll pass you over to Anna Elizabeth. Hello, everybody. As um, a local authority, uh, we try to show the way to and implement. Oh, could you please change the slide? Next one. Thank you. Well, as I was saying, as local authorities, we try to show the way and implement exemplary public policies contributing to the uh, development of new technologies. To do this, we have uh, next slide, please. Um, no, no, this one is okay. Uh, the public procurement is uh, a good tool to try to work um, on and to um, to um, um, promote uh, new technologies. Um, the uh, greater metropolitan area has developed um, a public procurement policy uh, based on four pillars. So support to the to the local economic ecosystem to promote the insertion of people in difficulty and their access to employment, um, to take into account the environmental aspect in purchase, and to develop innovative purchases. Next slide, please. And um, the four pillars are quite matching with the smart city. Uh, to go quite fast on each of these uh, pillars. Um, um, the uh, public, um, well, the, uh, mid, the greater Grenoble area tries to uh, pay the particular attention to the access of local economic actors in particular SMEs to calls for tender. However, um, we cannot um, we cannot favor them. Uh, we have regulations which uh, we have to to to, to, to apply the rules. Um, nevertheless, we try to to um, get them to uh, um, apply for calls for tenders. Um, 
well, we try to make public order more accessible to small and medium-sized businesses in the region. We have different um, possibilities to divide markets, um, to uh, divide the amounts, um, uh, which uh, make it possible for an SME to uh, to apply and to be able to, uh, once it wins the market, to, to be able to respond to it and to uh, put it through. Um, uh, we uh, communicate and we uh, we want to develop a guide for companies how to respond to calls for tenders to accompany them to this special uh, area. Uh, we will uh, enter into a phase of a, a phase of digitalization of calls for tender. And um, next slide, please. Um, a second pillar is to promote success to employment for public in difficulty. The third pillar is to take into account the environment and I, I, I run Environment. environmental sorry aspects um, in in the, the markets. And um, the, the fourth one is to promote innovative purchases. And uh, I will spend more time on this fourth pillar. Uh, for this, um, we have um, a two access to support innovation in the context of public procurement. Next slide, please. Uh, the first one is um, uh, Grenoble, um, the Greater Grenoble Area aims has the ambition to become a territory of ex uh, a, a test bed for uh, new technologies, um, trying to make it possible for companies to test their prototypes uh, in its buildings and technical infrastructures. Uh, that's what we did with a, um, a startup called Lancé Energy Storage, um, Rafael Meyer who is the CEO of a startup will, will have the word just after me. He will develop more on his technology. Um, we have also tested different types of electric buses with five different bus builders. Or we also have uh, um, constructed a new biomass um, heat production infrastructure with a unit with cogeneration. So we are trying to open our doors to uh, startups wanting to test the prototypes or to uh, develop uh, new um, infrastructures uh, with in co-development with uh, uh, companies and uh, we will organize this year next slide please uh, an event um, make it uh, organizing um, um, meetings uh, gathering public buyers and small companies to help them get to know each other better and um, and this this year we will have a focus on um, innovative companies to help them um, have their uh, technologies known by public buyers. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Elizabeth. Also, thank you. And now we're going to hear from two companies who are. Um, forging technological innovations in these spaces. First, Raphael Meyer, CEO of Lancy Energy Storage. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for giving me this uh, fantastic opportunity of uh, trying to explain how electronics uh, can, uh, can be the, the way of starting from a very fundamental need, which is just having uh, comfortable heat uh, during the winter season, how we can actually develop the smart grid, which is, of course, the underlying structure of any smart city, and uh, describe uh, also what, uh, what uh, how Grenoble was, uh, was our first experimentation field and uh, how much it uh, helped us. So we can go to next slide, please. Trying. And Okay. <laughs> So actually, you can even probably go directly to this to the next one. Uh, sorry, I will. Okay. So let me first introduce a bit uh, what we are talking about. Uh, it's a technology that is actually pretty popular in Europe, a bit less in the U.S., but still in some northern states and also in Canada. We talk about the electric radiator, which is just a, a classical way to. Uh, to generate heat from electricity. And of course, when we talk about smart city, about smart home, 
uh, we have to improve uh, the, the way just to provide this heat that is required during the winter season, as it's of course by far the, the main the main use of electricity or energy that we can have at, at home. And a problem, a very strong issue that we have in Europe, which is for instance the fuel poverty or the, the, the associated emissions of CO2 uh with those uh, with those old old systems that we have to replace and we would like to take the opportunity of the energy transition uh, the strong reduction of the cost of uh, pv panels for instance uh, also the the reduction of the cost of the battery uh, and the development of new ways just to produce and to consume electricity uh, on the same building so take the opportunity to to also again develop the smart grid that we need for any smart city. So we can go to the next slide. Here we go. So here is the solution that we propose that, that was by the way uh, awarded by the best of innovation in, in CES this year. So we are very proud of because we're the first uh, uh, company from the from this area getting this very prestigious award. So thanks for that uh, our dear American friends. Um, the product relies actually on three main pillars. The first one actually is pretty obvious, it's just to have a comfortable heat generation. And we combine different heating sources uh, within the same product uh, to anyway provide the, the, the level of comfort that is asked uh, from our end users. And then we're going to talk a bit about the Internet of Things and all the revolution of the artificial intelligence that we can deploy much easily now uh, with the strong cost reduction of the sensors, the associated connectivity, and that allows actually to use servers uh, to, to deploy uh, machine learning algorithms and have an automated uh, and very smart management system. And the last pillar is a one kilowatt hour lithium ion battery. So the, the approach consists in dividing uh, the storage uh, battery that we need for any home in the future into, the, into different uh, smaller battery size. Um, and just to add this battery at the rear side of the of the radiator. So you have in the same solution one heating system, very performing, and also the storage solution that you need uh, for the future of the of the building. And I will go back later on this. We're gonna go to the next slide, please. So for us, the definition of the, of the building of the future is really uh, to get a building that is able uh, to produce a part, at least partially, uh, its own electricity. And the, probably the best way, or at least the, the, the most cost effective, is just to deploy uh, solar panels on the rooftop of any building, uh, which is, of course, a way to produce free electricity uh, without any CO2 emission. The question, of course, is to have a storage system that will be charged during the daytime and used later on uh, during the nighttime, uh, just a way to keep uh, the, the, the electricity that can be produced uh, locally and used uh, really for the end user directly. And of course, our battery can do this for, for any kind of buildings. So next slide, please. Our value proposition actually is to cut by two, to divide by two the, the heating bill um, compared to a traditional heating systems but without any investment. I mean, we have from the fact that we thought in our own battery systems. It means that as the end user, you just buy the radiator, the battery is provided for free, which is of course a bit unbeatable uh, compared to uh, other approach that we can think about like the Tesla Powerwall or Zonen battery in Germany, where of course the kilowatt hour costs pretty much. And that, that, will, that comes actually from the, the grid services that we can generate with those uh, divided batteries. We talk about demand response. We talk about peer-to-peer -peer of energy. That's the way for us to collect associated revenues with this battery and provide it for free for our end users. Uh, so it means that really the doors are now open, can be now open for strong development of, renew of renewable energies in self-consumption a bit everywhere especially, of course, in Grenoble. I'm going to go to the next slide. <laughs> I'm showing the slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> OK, 
So today we are 15 people, uh, and I will go fast on this. It's just to say that before starting our collaboration with uh, uh, with uh, Anne Elizabeth Cott, we were four. It means that uh, af before and after the project that we had together with uh, Grenoble Metropole, uh, we we really strongly uh, uh, increased our our uh, the, our our team size. And that's uh, for that I would like to thank uh, also. Oh, no. Next slide, please. I'm showing the map slide. Okay, I will I will go so fast on this. It's just to mention that uh, we can find this um, this configuration of uh, electric heating uh, also in the U.S., also in Canada, and we are starting a collaboration with the licensing uh, for North America. So it means that dear dear friends from New York or or uh, or U.S. in more generally speaking. Uh, please feel free to contact us uh, for any kind of uh, experimentation. We're gonna, we will be pleased to uh, to answer your questions. Next slide. Okay, and now I'd like shortly to uh, finish my uh, my presentation by sharing uh, some uh, uh, some uh, some some main facts on the experimentation we run uh, with. Uh, uh, with uh, Grenoble uh, during our first year of uh, uh, of activity. So next slide. We equipped uh, actually a building, uh, office building from uh, Grenoble uh, that was badly uh, thermal insulated with a really obsolete uh, radiators. Uh, and uh, we proposed as an alternative uh, to this, uh, to those old systems, our uh, our radiator. It was part of a, of a more global uh, experimentation that helped us a lot actually to get the first uh, user feedback. So we're gonna go to the next slide. The experimentation started at uh, during the, the winter 2016-2017 and we could prove uh, a pretty amazing result uh, compared to the state of the arts researchers of 60, uh, sorry, yeah, um, 50, 56 percent, sorry, uh, of reduction of the maximum load curve, the maximum power need, uh, which is pretty amazing. That's the effect of the battery, of course. And more globally, more than 50 percent of economy on the heating bill. So our promise uh, was uh, was achieved, uh, and that gives uh, a return on investment in five years, about five years. Which is which is actually pretty amazing in in the field of uh, of building and uh, and uh, and renovation. So let's say uh, this experimentation was really a success, and uh, we uh, we are we 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 learned a lot actually from this uh, from this experiment. Uh, next slide, please. I'm showing the experimentation slide, Raphael. Raphael, are you still with us? Okay, I'm afraid we might have lost connectivity with our European friends for the moment. Um, So I think what I'll do is uh, for now, um, wrap up uh, Raphael and Lancy Energy Storage presentation and um, move on to our next company presenter. Uh, this is for a totally different dimension of smart cities, uh, Matt Snyder from OmniMesh. Uh, thank you, Alison. Uh, good day. Uh, I'm the CMO of OmniMesh, which is a startup in Syracuse, New York. Uh, which provides a super low cost consumer owned platform for connectivity and storage. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, folks in attendance and especially our hosts for having us here. Um, OmniMesh are here to give a thought piece on an issue with smart city deployment in the US, uh, which also has implications in the European market and how to efficiently solve it. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
Um, in OmniMesh's view, the, the U.S. plays catch up in smart city deployment because there's not enough affordable bandwidth to go around. It's tangled up with 5G and the, the slow pace of deployment of 5G and the management problems of our big domestic telecom companies. Um, these companies are slow to change because they're hanging on to an outdated business model that makes the last mile very uh, comparatively more expensive in the U.S. than globally. Uh, and the way those large telecoms perceive economic risk means they have little incentive to move on anyone else's timeline but their own. Um, it, it's not terribly different from the economics of 3G deployment in Europe uh, in, in the last two decades. At the end of the day, 5G here will be just more of the same from an economic perspective. A huge investment in, in centralized, wholly owned infrastructure with the costs of the deployment and debt service passed along to consumers. And in our view, this, this will really hamper smart city innovation if we don't find a way around it. Um, on the other hand, it is a tremendous opportunity for companies and for communities that are willing to try disruptive business models and technologies uh, if they can bring together the engineering and manufacturing partners to pull it off. Um, keep in mind that the big, they're, they're known as incumbent local exchange carriers or ILEX, uh, like Verizon, uh, which are publicly traded and driven by their shareholders. And right now, all of the ILEX are moving in the same direction, which is a, a land grab for future 5G customers. And this is a tremendously expensive undertaking. Um, Monday's Wall Street Journal had a piece on Verizon alone uh, spending $10 billion per quarter in capital expenditures on wireless. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the, the reason the carriers are so inefficient uh, has to do with where they came from. It's, it's been ingrained in their corporate cultures dating back to the, the founding of Bell Telephone. Um, here, the, the ILEX have traditionally embraced a centralized property model in which they own uh, most or all of the infrastructure and then compete against each other with proprietary last mile technologies uh, in a regulatory environment that, that has historically kept new entrants and technologies at bay. Um, this worked up to a point, but the, the carriers had a reckoning in the 90s and 2000s, and now they are due another one. Um, they have a huge legacy infrastructure that they are on the hook to maintain. Uh, they pay for enormous workforces, CapEx and compliance costs. Uh, their markets have largely matured and their debt to equity ratios are stuck close to one to one. And these factors are what are driving the mega mergers like AT&T and Time Warner. Uh, efforts by these companies to return value to shareholders because they, they have next to no other way to do so. Uh, it's, it's gotten so bad that most of the big incumbents here have stopped laying fiber. Uh, even Google has slowed its efforts to, to fill the gap to lay fiber. And uh, really, the ILEX, the, the big carriers, have it the worst because they're stuck maintaining 1984 technology while promising us innovation by 2020 or 2021 to meet smart city demand. Uh, so we can't help but be a little skeptical of their ability to bring it to scale in time. So to recap, uh, the ILEX can't afford to pivot. Uh, their, their physical plant is so old that it's all they can do to maintain it, much less upgrade or replace it uh, in the U.S., uh, regulation and legacy customers who are still on copper make this an even tougher place to pivot. And for generations, uh, periods of profitability in the domestic telecom industry have been driven by consumer acquisition, and the ILEX executive teams and shareholders are still stuck on this model. Uh, next slide, please. The, the implication for smart cities uh, is that the innovation will lag behind while this connectivity gap exists. Um, here's a quick visual of the mismatch. Uh, on the left is a projection of demand from devices connected to IoT platforms. On the right is Verizon's current subscriber growth. Um, the, it's hard to believe that Verizon will be able to close that gap at 1.8% growth a year, uh, or even at 2.5%, which is what Verizon project their subscriber growth will be after the 5G rollout, and that's going to take another three or four years at least. So if communities uh, rely only on the big incumbents for the needed bandwidth, they're going to be waiting a long time or paying a high cost. Um, we don't yet have the large scale data sets on how smart cities will deal with this, but there is an analogy in, in what's happening to Netflix right now. 
Um, Netflix have a really good idea for distributing content, but they're stubbornly cash flow negative. And that has to do with their carriage and storage costs. Um, last year's annual report, their income statement showed more than $1 billion US spent on data transmission, uh, software storage, and the other costs of the custom delivery network that they had to build themselves in order to overcome the inefficiencies of centralized network providers. Uh, that means that, that Netflix spent more on their CDN than their entire annual income. The takeaway is the inefficient network hurts entities that rely on connectivity to get their work done. And OmniMesh's posture is that this limit uh, will be the primary limiting factor for smart city deployment uh, in terms of the cost and efficiency of connectivity of the devices on the grid. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the good news is we have a more efficient way to solve the problem. It leverages the sharing economy, uh, new radio storage and routing technologies, uh, and especially the enhancement of those technologies by new manufacturing capabilities. So the future of connectivity looks like consumer-owned decentralized networks in which consumers pay only for what they use, uh, security and privacy built in at the physical layers, as well as in the routing protocols that drive the network, and storage, which is accomplished at the edge of the network, um, directly at the edge, right on the consumer's nodes, not just near them, uh, and transactions monetized at the edge on a blockchain ledger. Next slide, please. Um, OmniMesh posture is that this transition to a consumer-owned network is inevitable. Um, and we know this in part because verticals where sharing economy solutions have emerged uh, they, they tend to outcompete the centralized incumbents. Um, consumers will, will engage in their typical behavior when they don't have a choice, but once they do have choice, uh, consumers and eventually entire communities have tended to flock to decentralized solutions, mainly for economic reasons. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, at OmniMesh, we're well on our way to accelerating this transition in network technology. Uh, our goal is to deliver the abundance of connectivity that will be demanded by smart city applications. Um, we, we are the platform for those platforms and we'll scale this at a much lower marginal cost than 5G. Um, we are not alone in entering the space. Um, smart capital is starting to wake up to the problem uh, in the US as well as globally. Um, it witnessed the flow of capital into companies like Starry, Iungo, uh, Venim, and Storage Labs, uh, which each tackle a different piece of the, the connectivity and storage problem. Um, and at OmniMesh, we are leveraging advanced manufacturing partners and a business model that will make us the leader in capital efficiency in this space. Uh, so our view is that 5G is still going to happen. It, it still has a role to play in smart city deployment. Uh, but it's not likely to capture the market as AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint shareholders hope it will. Um, instead, that small cell technology is going to grow up as an adjunct to shared decentralized networks, which are more efficient, faster to scale, um, and better able to meet the needs of smart cities. So combined and at scale, um, this combination of technologies will enable uh, the, the growth and deployment of smart city solutions, uh, and this, this will make the user growth curve sustainable, regardless of what cash flow troubles the, the ILUX may encounter. Um, these devices and, and business innovations will create new use cases that, that we can't even begin to imagine yet. Um, it's, it's not unlike the, the last presenter's notion of putting a, a battery on board a, a heating device to meet future uh, unanticipated needs. Um, our, our posture is that we grow network capacity in much the same way. Uh, so there will be a lot of movement and surprises and, and not just involving the presumptive 5G winners. Um, we think of the smart city movement, uh, if you characterize it as such, as a highly competitive environment. And the winners will be the communities uh, as well as their partners that are forward thinking to adopt and, and play on capital efficient networks. Uh, and with that, I think I'm at my time uh, and we'll take questions at the end. Thank you, Matt. Um, 
I read that Wall Street Journal article as well with a little bit of anxiety about how the race is on for 5G leadership uh, globally and the role of startup companies in the United States in particular because of the regulatory and uh, historic legacy environment that you described, um, you know, makes the work of OmniMesh and similar companies very important. And I just wanted to note briefly that OmniMesh is taking advantage of um, at least one, I think multiple New York State innovation programs. So New York State does try to support the development of technologies um, by, for example, um, providing support for uh, spaces that um, OmniMesh is in the tech garden in Syracuse. Is that right? Are you still there? Uh, I'm here. We are. And particularly, uh, it, it also is uh, very adept at bringing together partnerships. Um, so, you know, when I said earlier that we're leveraging partnerships, those, those run the gamut from advanced manufacturing to cybersecurity to RF engineering, um, you know, all, all of which are, are leveraging the economic development infrastructure that exists here. Uh, and I would encourage anybody that's interested in that kind of a collaborative environment to take a close look at, at, at what's going on here, particularly in upstate New York. Thank you for that. Um, Fuse Hub is a good place to start for all that, I might add. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, our final presenter is John Spring from National Grid, the project manager there. Again, that's a, a utility um, that serves um, a fair amount of upstate New York and is doing some exciting things in the area of smart cities. Excellent. Well, thank you, guys. Um, hi, John Spring here with National Grid. Um, uh, Matthew, very interesting. I'm actually going to reach out to you regarding <laughs> uh, uh, your company. I think we we have talked to you before. Um, we do share um, some some footprint with you guys in upstate New York. Um, we are National Grid, just for those who um, want to know on the phone, are one of the largest investor-owned utilities in the U.S. We're actually headquartered in Warwick, uh, UK, England, um, where we are the just the electric uh, system operator in the U.K. Uh, here in the U.S., we have both electric and gas territory in New York State, uh, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. We serve uh, over 7 million customers. And just to give you guys an idea, my, myself and the team that I work in, and I'm glad uh, there's some synergy between the, the previous uh, presentation and this, is that um, being part of a large utility that's regulated, uh, it is difficult to make change happen. However, uh, I work in a group that was formerly called New Energy Solutions and now part of innovation and development within the customer organization here. So there is a push within this large company to, to create change, to look at alternative energies, um, solar energy storage, uh, electric vehicles, and in this case, smart cities. Um, we're working with the city of Schenectady on what's called a REV demonstration project, REV meaning reforming the energy vision of New York. Um, and that's a regulatory environment that allows uh, for uh, regulated utilities in New York State to try new, try new things, try new business models, um, look into new technologies, and um, hopefully uh, discover new ways to, to, to modernize the grid. Um, you can hit the next slide. All right. Well, while that's coming up, um, what we're trying to do with Connect D, just for those who um, may not know, uh, it's, a, it's a small size city um, outside of Albany um, in upstate New York. It was actually the home and founder of uh, General Electric, um, which they still have a, a presence there. And in upstate New York, predominantly, um, and within Mass and Rhode Island or other territories, we own uh, roughly 460,000 some odd streetlights. So when we think about streetlights, um, a lot of cities today are um, moving into uh, LED technology, and what we're seeing now is that there are even intelligent LED, LED lights out there, um, which would offer controls, um, being able to dim them, turn them on and off, et cetera, um, and also um, being able to control them in such a fashion to save more energy for companies, for, for, for excuse me, for our for cities and customers. Um, and there's, this also help, runs on software platforms that can help with other um, city concerns, such as safety, environmental, um, health and such. And we hope that this will all move into 
um, developing the Internet of Things. And when it comes to partnerships, and I'm glad we've talked a lot about partnerships, smart cities really what we're all learning is require um, extensive partnerships, whether it's with cities themselves, their utilities, uh, new technology providers. Um, if you want to just hit down uh, one more slide on this slide. What, and what we're trying to show here is that while we can help convert cities over to LED and help them save energy, and you would think as a utility, why would we want to help save customers' energy? Um, we here in, in, in the U.S. are decoupled in that uh, energy costs are a pass-through to our customers. So we're actually actively always looking for ways to help them save on their energy bills. Um, and we're hoping that this demonstration project that we're doing in upstate New York will, in essence, enable some smart cities um, by providing a platform, if you will, uh, to give cities a, a means to uh, add additional uh, services that could help some with some of their some of their uh, city and um, resident concerns. And usually, that has a lot to do with crime or traffic or things of that nature. Um, and looking for solutions within the Internet of Things, we hope to find or at least get market animation started uh, through having this type of platform to build off of. And I can walk you get down a little bit deeper on the next slide if you want to jump down one more. So how does it all really begin, right? So taking these LEDs, um, we would like to what we're trying to do is put these intelligent nodes on. Um, and there's a lot of companies who are now exploring these intelligent nodes. Um, and really that node just allows us to turn on and off the lights, dim them, meter them as well, so we can give people more accurate bill, billing and better control over their billing um, and their energy consumption. And then also allow us to maybe monitor some of the voltage, uh, which could help us with some grid facing um, concerns if there's a, a high use or high peak times of the day. You can go down one more. What's kind of new here is that all these nodes need a, a network to, in essence, operate on, right? Which could be an RF mesh network similar to Smart Grid or AMI, which we're starting to roll out in New York State, in Massachusetts, Rhode Island. Um, and all this requires uh, a software platform. And as a company, as a, as a utility, we're looking into how can we offer this as a service to our customers, allowing them to control their lighting and in a way have access to the lighting controls and and ways to in which to to do to manage their energy. And uh, this will also have to, a lot to do with cellular backhaul. And this is just one way of looking at it. We're also looking at point to multi-point solutions for those who are aware of different communication protocols. Um, you can go down one more. And on this network, and I guess you can hit the next button as well, <laughs> or two, I think there's two. Um, perfect. And so lastly, what we're thinking here is on this network, if we're building out a com communications network, and if it is a kind of an RF mesh or a lower bandwidth, a lot of other sensors can run on this. Um, predominantly around sound detection, things like gunshot detection, which might be helpful for a city, um, things around surveillance or parking management, um, a lot of different sensors and smart city technology can run on the same network and or it could be built upon or built on top of and we can in essence have a shared network or a platform to enable cities to build off of that network and depending on the type of city and depending on what type of problems they may have or things they might want um, those are the questions and what in essence we're trying to figure out here in Schenectady and you can just go down one more slide and I think this is my final one to give you a little bit more depth as to um, how this might work on a national grid mesh network of sorts um, that could be on these uh, you can see all the, the street lights there on the on the left hand side and along the bottom here is a is a group of different type of sensors meters um, that we're we're looking to install in the city of Schenectady however if you look on the right hand side there's going to be a city owned Wi-Fi network that they're trying to build out in additional security and traffic management that will fall under the the city's responsibility. So you can see how we're partnering here with the city and certain technology providers to build out this network of sensors and data that can flow through our street light infrastructure. And we're talking to the, the usual big companies that you might think of, AT&T, GE, Verizon, Cisco, Intel, and we're hoping to partner with a group of these companies um, 
for this project. And we're in the midst of trying to determine who, who those partners are in the meantime. So we haven't done any of this yet. This is all conceptual. Um, we have approval to do this and we're, we're moving ahead. So we hope to start uh, construction in the next couple months. Uh, so if there's any interest in updates on how things are going or lessons learned or uh, anything along those lines, please feel free to reach out to me. And thank you very much. That's all I have. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Um, okay, uh, so I apologize to everybody that we weren't able to hear the, um, the concluding remarks from Lancy Energy Storage, but just also wanted to comment that it's very exciting to hear about the increasing economic feasibility of some of these energy solutions. Um, well, actually, uh, we, we, uh, we are we're back. back. We're back. Hi, you're we're back. back so, uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be uh, much pleased to, to, to answer any questions. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> I also just wanted to highlight it as a, a great example of public-private partnership in uh, deploying new innovations uh, between uh, Lancy Energy Storage and, and the city of Grenoble. Um, so we we don't have questions uh, that have come through, but uh, if you think of any after the webinar, um, really these panelists stand ready to assist you um, in getting connected in any way. This is their contact information. I'll return to this slide um, at the very end. Um, you know, this is Allison Slack. I'm with Fuse Hub. Um, we're a great place to start if you don't know who to reach out to in the New York State innovation ecosystem. It is our role as a nonprofit supported by New York State to help companies navigate uh, the industry experts across New York at different university research centers um, and at different organizations that are charged with assisting manufacturers with competitiveness. So if you go to www.fusehub.com, how we work is you can submit um, a request through our portal at any time of day. You'll have somebody give you a call within 24 to 48 hours to begin talking through whatever your particular challenge or opportunity is. Um, and this is a, a no cost service uh, to get you um, started down the right path of, of connections to New York State's innovation assets. Um, I wanted to uh, again highlight that we have uh, the final webinar in this series coming up Thursday, October 18th at this same time. And that will focus on the intersection of advanced electronics and energy systems. Um, so we hope you can join us for that one, and we'll get the registration page up soon if it's not already. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll close this here, and I'll, I'll leave this slide up for a little bit so you can copy uh, some contact information. Thank you to all our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.